Some would say it was the devil's playground. There were no churches here. Believers were sent here to die. First year I was here, there was a voice that I kept hearing over and over again saying, get out of town, leave Magadan. Magadan, a hub town with a population of 150,000, lies on the Sea of Ohotsk in the far east of Siberia, some 2,000 kilometers from the nearest city. Magadan was the administrative center of Stalin's Kolyma Arctic death camps, the Gulags, a vast system of work camps and prisons in Siberia through which millions were imprisoned and perished from exposure, starvation, and execution between 1932 and 1954. We know that there were many, many unmarked graves and they actually call Magadan one large grave site. And the prisoners themselves can witness to thousands dying and hundreds of people, hundreds of bodies being bulldozed over in different times of the year in a mass grave. When gold and other precious metals were discovered in the Kolyma region in the early 20th century, a wealth to feed the USSR's hungry industrial expansion, Stalin's Dalstroy project, a government agency formed to mine the reserves, initially drew upon criminals as a workforce. But prisoners soon included perceived enemies of the state, intellectuals, political opponents, and finally, Christians. To the socialist mind, it was an ideal scenario. Enemies of the state were put to productive use in crucial industrial developments with the highest possible return on investment while being kept from poisoning the socialist ideal. The conditions were brutal and in the end prisoners, men and women, were forced to work 12 hours a day and food was rationed. The combination of exhaustion, hunger and extreme climate reduced the average life expectancy to six months. We don't really know how many were imprisoned, and the archives are not open to know how many actually died. There are ship logs that show how many prisoners were taken from Vladivostok up to Magadan, sometimes six to 7,000 in the ship hold. There are some recorded accounts of prisoners, how many were counted in a particular day in Magadan. I had a list, and in 1942, October 17th, there was 165,000 prisoners in Magadan. Prisoners came, they were selected, and they were sent up into the camps. Stalin sent many Catholics to Far East Siberia into the prison camps. And these repressed then are the people that were in the prison camps. They were exiled after being freed after their sentences. And because of exile, then they stayed and married and had families. And so the repressed are the people that I encountered in Magadan that have suffered in the prison camps. After Perestroika in 1989, Father Michael Shields was sent to Magadan by Archbishop Francis Hurley of Anchorage, Alaska to celebrate the city's first ever public mass. When I received the call to come, it was not something I was looking for. It was not something I'd even imagined. I had given up on Magadan. I didn't like Magadan. And I was full of fear. Father Michael and his associate, Pastor Father David Means, initially lived and celebrated Mass in a renovated apartment. There was a moment during the retreat when it was like the Lord took His grace and my fear and knitted together and created this great gift. 
And I woke up the morning after that happened and my heart was full of joy. And I knew it was his call and it was his work. And when it's God's work, you have to do it because it's so attractive. So it's not my will. It's not my idea. It's God's call. And so I'm free to say yes. And he's the one who keeps me here. The congregation, the Brothers of the Heart of Jesus, soon outgrew the small space. With the help of the Catholic charity Aid to the Church in Need, they built a new church. Since that time, Father Michael's work has grown to encompass the needs of the flourishing parish and community, with a particular focus on the so-called repressed, those last remaining witnesses to the gulags. I'm called to pray in the camps. These people certainly prayed in the camps. Many of them were Catholic. I think I'll gather them together. Nobody has ever done this. So I did uh, literally an announcement throughout Magadan, through contacts, and I gathered for the first time those who were in the prison camps in the public library. There were 80 to 90 people that have never seen each other although they may be in the prison camps together. In fact, often what would happen is someone would see someone and recognize them and say, you were in the same camp with me in 1940. We were in the same barrack. And there would be tears and recognition. And these people lived by themselves in their apartments, oftentimes not telling their families who they were because they were afraid that it would impact the work, impact the children for the education. So this gathering became a place where they would reclaim their life and start speaking about their life. Little by little, they started sharing their stories. And I decided that I needed to do this regularly, so we gathered once a month, the last Saturdays, and we've been doing this for over 10 years. Yes, and we all came to love Father Michael very much. Well, Father Michael is quite simply like one of us, quite simply. These are so important to the people. They were able to start speaking about a very pain in their lives that they weren't able to speak before. I was arrested before I was born, in my mother's womb. When they arrested me, I had no parents, I had no one. It was a terrible time, it was winter. They beat us so much, they tormented us cruelly. They gathered us up to transport in cattle trucks to the labor camps. Then they led us 120 kilometers on foot through the taiga. There was neither barrack nor house, just tents. Imagine, by then it was already 50 degrees below zero. They herded us into this tent. The bunk beds were laid out in two rows, made of roughly hewn pine trees, with a bedding of roughly cut twigs, just like that. They immediately assigned us to felling forest trees. We went to work immediately. The worst things were the cold and hunger. 
That was the most horrendous. We were teams of eight people. To begin with, we had to fell 10 cubic meters of wood, which we then had to cut down to two cubic meter portions and stack them in cords. They continuously raised the quota to 12, then 16, and 18 cubic meters. Of course, we went hungry the whole day. We weren't given any lunch except some bread. Who could stick it out would keep a piece for supper. Who couldn't would eat everything in the morning and then have nothing. Nothing. And the soup? Oh, the soup. God, it was water, a kind of water, no visible fat, nothing, except a swimming granule. The humiliation was inherent, the regime terrible, because of the exceptional brutality. When we were in Vakhanka, they would check the register. They had to, and they did so whenever they felt like it, and so had a standing to attention in the middle of the night, almost naked. And it was most terrible during snowstorms, when for some reason they would all begin to execute their own set procedures. Soldiers would enter the barracks and check everything, rip up the planking, the floorboards, take the bunk beds apart, check everything and everybody, all by the rule book. And they would only chase everybody back into the barracks after they had checked everything. Imagine that. It was very hard. We had a cruel governor for half a year. He would say, I don't need your work. I need your suffering. That's what he would say. Oh, it was frightening. They'd always end up saying, I have no bitterness in my heart. Because of their prayer, they learned to forgive. I believe that's why they survived. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have mercy on me, God, through your great compassion and infinite mercy, erase my improprieties. Repeatedly wash away my wrongdoings, cleanse me from my sins. You see, prayer was with us every step of the way. We could not do without prayer. There were times when the end quite simply seemed upon us. You think it's all over, you will not survive. And yet, you turn to the Lord and everything finds its place. Oftentimes they would pray without even moving their lips at night. Uh, they would be silent because if any image or any indication you were praying, you could be pulled aside and put into a holding prison. At the same time, they took great, great uh, chances. I made this little book. You see how I stitched it all around, embroidered it a bit, and so created a little prayer book. I wrote some of it myself, whilst other places the girls wrote a variety of prayers in this prayer book, for memory's sake. They gave us fish, flounder, with large fish bones, from which I made a small needle eye, passed a thread, and embroidered two big images of the Mother of God. And all because God's mother always helped me. We made rosaries from bread. We rolled the beads like so, until we made 55 and more. And then, with needle and thread, it was all strictly forbidden. May Jesus Christ be praised. Forever and ever.
My dear people, whenever I hear these words, painful memories return, many times. But we must remember for others, for the future. This is why we bow lowly before these men and women who bore witness. Many thanks. It's not a political action, it's from the heart, from a human life. Michael saves all of us. He gives us joy. This being together with each other is actually so very good. And he is very good, Michael. They always regretted there was no place really for them to pray and to remember their dead. They'd had monuments in Magadan called the Mask of Sorrows, but it's more or less a gigantic Russian mask, not overly received by the repressed, although they go there sometimes, but there was no place to pray. And so when we built the church, we built specifically a chapel, what I call Chapel of the Martyrs, for those who died in the prison camps. All the repressed brought crosses, and for their families and for their friends, we placed it on a wall to rem Just reminds us where we are and who we're praying for and who we're praying with. Because I think many of these people died are uncanonized saints. So we even have icons in the, in the chapel that represent priests and sisters and laity that died in the Kalama region are not maybe officially canonized, but certainly in the eyes of the Lord, giving them your life in these prison camps, they're saints. I don't have a person in the parish that didn't have somebody sent to the gulags, somebody that suffered in the gulags. So a gospel of fear that was planted in the people's heart is to this day, People still have a deep fear. So the impact is great and the destruction of lives and families and with that, the depression, the alcoholism, broken families, divorce rates, divorces are 80% in Russia. People losing their soul. The communists destroyed many people and nearly destroyed the church. But when faith is rediscovered or discovered even for the first time in Russia, people grow very fast. I looked for it in sex and alcohol. Wherever I looked, I found nothing. Until, that is, I came to church, which is when I realized that I needed God and I needed the church. I mean that communion that I cannot attain in this world in which nothing, which only gave me emptiness, where I truly achieved a spiritual peace and stability, where I finally found my family. The church gave me one more chance at life on this earth. I should have died before coming here. I believe in one true living God who helps me every day and who I see in the real world in answers to my prayers, who guides me through various times of trial and who, I'm certain, guides me through those trials in order that I might be ever closer to Him. He rejoices that I protect His creation he rejoices that we worship.
we had a retreat on this retreat, there's a time in which you name the children and you light candles. And you light these candles for each child that was aborted. And there was uh, five women. And I counted at the end of this service 47 candles for these five women. And it's not at all unusual to have 10 or more abortions. I had three children. Now we are five, with the birth of two twin girls. I live with my fiancé. I recently found out that I was pregnant. When I found out that I was expecting twins, my mother-in-law didn't want me to have them. For financial reasons. Of course, it was all to do with finances. I was sort of happy, though my next thought was that when my fiancé hears about it, he will most probably send me away to have an abortion. Because we already had three children, how could we have even more, seeing we weren't yet standing firmly on our own two feet? Exactly that. And that is how he will look at 11 weeks. Imagine that. He will already have a head, hands, legs, and even his stomach will be visible. Truly, a real child that one can carry in one's hands. Please try. Don't be afraid. Please imagine what it looks like. And now hold it like a mother holds her child. Please hold it. It's like that. Very shortly, in about 20 weeks, and you will be able to hold your own child. I went to hospital and immediately saw on the door that this was the place mothers seeking help could come to. Exactly. A kind of support site. I can't remember exactly what was written there. I went inside and they explained how they could sort of help me. This is where we met Father Michael, who has been helping us. And look, my twins are almost two months old. Russia has economic problems. That may be one of the main issues that drives young women to have abortions. But oftentimes I find as well terrible influences from husbands, boyfriends, grandmothers, that a child is a bother, that a child is a barrier to something. Conservatively, they say, for every 10 births, there's 13 abortions. It's anywhere from 70, 75% of pregnancies end up in abortions. I know that to be a fact in the terms of not only an abortion, but repeated abortions. Julia, <laughs> What I love is I get to go to what's called the birthing hospital and I've walked with this young woman, and who's now around me? The grandmother who wanted to have an abortion, the boyfriend who wanted to have the abortion, the husband who wanted to have the abortion, and all are delighted with this new birth. And I thought, what a tragedy, huh? If she would have had an abortion, because now they have this treasure. And this happens every single time.
One of the great gifts in Siberian Russia is monastic life. So Russians understand monks. So the spirituality I'd like to live is a monk in a parish to show people what it means to pray by praying. A pustinya is a Russian word that means desert, and it's a place where a person goes to pray. Normally I, I go to pustinya once a week for about 24 hours and it's a place to encounter God. The hardest part of Pustinia is you go there not to do anything. I'm active, and so it's hard not to be active to wait upon the Lord. So the hardest is to wait for His Word, for, for God to speak. And it's enough to live for many, many months on that one moment where Christ reveals Himself. It's really a window to the divine. Here I found what I've been looking for as a priest, a way of emptying myself and being filled in, with Christ in, a, in an incredible way through the suffering of His people, through the suffering of this country, through the pain of this country, through the incredible joys of this country. Russia is a place where there's many, many lessons to be learned. What we do need to learn is how easy we can dehumanize a person. We can learn how easy it is that life can become unsacred. It's certainly a lesson the world has to learn.